rough up here. So where does God live? You're happy to take your responses. Where does he live? Yes, Simon, you're the first. In his people, yes, I thought we'd get that one. Anything else? A couple of seconds. Uh, yes, Danny. He lives in heaven. Yep, yes. In our hearts. Yep. Yes. In the cloud. Oh, the one that Pastor Chris was talking about. That's exactly where he lives. Okay. Well, actually, the, the, the question is a little bit misleading because it's only part one of the entire question because the question is, where does God live and who does he live with? Uh, so to explore it, um, we, we did a little bit of a Bible study on this with a group of people. I posed the question, they came back a week later and we got lots of really interesting late questions, uh, responses. And uh, we just, I'll just pick three of them out and then we'll go to the scripture I want to concentrate on. So Genesis 1, just flip through these really quickly. Genesis 1. Some of these concepts are really difficult for us as humans to understand. Um, our world is framed upon the things that we, we can see and do and uh, experience in one way or another through our senses. So some of the thoughts that we might put forward here are a little bit hard for us. So Genesis 1.1, very simple. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So everything that we know around us, God created the question is, where was he when he created it? So he created it from somewhere. And we don't know what that somewhere is. We've got no idea. So he inhabited something. And while he was sitting around one afternoon, thought, I know what, I'll create heaven and earth. So he, he was somewhere. And then he created where we are. Ooh. John 14. <laughs> I think you know exactly the scripture that I'm going to go to here. This is talking about John 14, uh, talking about um, keeping God's commandments and that if we do, then God's going to send the Holy Spirit. And I'll just get to the key verse, uh, verse, 16, uh, verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, verse 16, Jesus speaking. I'll pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever or live within you. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot see receive because it sees him not neither knows him but you know him he dwells another living word dwells with you and shall be in you so somehow god is going to live in every single one of us so he lives in that let's call it his porch that's where he created us so he lives on his porch he lives in us and then this is a really good one i love this one uh, revelation 21 this is really going to test some of you um once you realise what's coming, you know, like why have you walked in the Lord for all these all these years? So in Revelation 21, verse 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. So he's back on his porch and he's doing another one. Didn't like the first one, making another one. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, there was no more sea, and I saw John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. We heard a great voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So there's another situation where on his back porch he's creating a new heaven and new earth. There's a new Jerusalem. And do you know, who can tell me what a tabernacle is? Yes. A tent. Isn't that exciting? All of this so that we can live in a tent with God. I personally am very excited about that because I love camping. Some of you might be challenged, but that's what it is. We're going to live in a tent, so it's all about a tent. They're just interesting concepts, aren't they? It, it, God's portraying, I'm going to be with you. I want to be with you. I want to be part of your lives. I want to be intimately involved with you. The one that I really want to concentrate on is Isaiah 57, if we can turn there, please. That was just a little bit of uh, fun. The, this evening's talk is going to get a little bit, little bit more serious. So Isaiah 57, verse 15. It says, For thus says, hope you're all there. 
is the key scripture for tonight. With us saith the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. That's something for us to get our head around. Where the absence of time, God is going to be where there is no time. God was where there is no time. He created time as an artificial construct for us so that we can live our lives. When it all comes to an end, he's going to do away with time and he's going to live in eternity. The important thing is in verse, in the second part of that um, passage, it says, I dwell in the high and holy place, which we all desire to be in. We call it heaven. With him also that is a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. It's a very, I'll read that again. It's very interesting. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. So it talks about a person who is contrite. Uh, contrition is a topic that we would normally associate with repentance, but it's a little stronger than that. So a humble person that God is happy to live with for eternity with is someone who has made themselves low, who has uh, abased themselves. The description of a humble person is one who is depressed, not as in uh, mentally depressed, but made low. Okay, so you've lowered yourself. You are high, you are arrogant, you are self-righteous, you've lowered yourself, and it's part of the way that we come to the Lord. Contrite is actually um, humility on steroids or repentance on steroids. The word contrite means crushed. Another word is destruction, bruise, to break in pieces, to collapse. So we're going to explore the difference between repentance versus contrition. This was uh, probably triggered by Pastor Chris's talk um, a couple of weeks back regarding David and the sure mercies of David and how the Lord was merciful towards him, even though he did some pretty um, crazy things. And we're going to have a look at his situation in a minute. The call... So let's go to Matthew, Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, please. So Matthew chapter 4, <clears throat> excuse me, verse, this is just after he has um, been in the wilderness uh, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He's been tempted by the devil. He's taken care of those things. So he begins his ministry and there's a call from, from the Lord. Verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And guess, I want to make a difference between the concept of repentance and the concept of contrition. Repentance is probably something that happens um, at the beginning of someone's call to the Lord. Um, and it's, um, it's something that you apply to yourself if you're facing some minor consequences in your life. Oh, I did that again. I'm, so, I'm an idiot. Oh, sorry, I won't do that again. That's the, 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 the thinking with repentance. The word repent is to think differently or to reconsider it's quite a very powerful act because people are, too, are very proud and they refuse to do that in the first place. But those that humble themselves and reconsider their lives, like every single, body, every single person here has done, then they then follow through and they say, okay, I'd like to do this differently. What do I have to do? Um, so the call to salvation is to repent and to have a genuine desire to know God and to follow him. Another way that you could consider repentance is that you don't really mean it. Like you've been caught by the policeman with the radar. Oh, I'm sorry, officer. No, you're not. You're sorry you got caught. You're not sorry about the act because you're not going to go away and say, I'm, going to I'm going to correct the error of my ways. I'm never, ever going to do this again. You're just never, ever going to get caught again, hopefully. So they're two different things. And if anyone's felt the power of the one point for a 12-month period, They'll understand what I'm talking about. You lose all your demerit points. The judge gives you one point and says, if you lose this one, you lose your license. Then you're sorry. But if you just get three demerit points, you go, meh. 300 bucks, oh, sorry about that. But you can see that there's that one repentance is genuine and one is forced upon you and you go, oh, I'm sorry. Contrition. Let's go to Second Samuel. So I've sort of painted a, 
a very light-hearted picture of repentance. Please, um, repentance is a very serious thing. So if we go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, this is when, um, this is just after David has um, he's committed adultery with uh, Bathsheba, he's uh, killed her husband, and he's tried to cover it up. On those three areas, he should have been stoned to death under the law of Moses. But God uh, was very merciful to him. And, we, and please refer to Pastor Chris's talk, an excellent talk on that topic. On that topic. And uh, verse 7, Nathan said to David, Thou art that man. He talked about a little story about a man stealing another man's sheep. Thou art that man, thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed thee king of Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house, thy master's wives into thy bosom, gave thee the house of Israel and Judah. And if they had been too little, I moreover would have given thee such and such, such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord, to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. So I guess this, this, the, the picture I'm painting here is that David is facing an extremely serious situation, something that could require his life. This isn't being caught speeding. This isn't being, oh, I'm sorry about that, okay? This isn't a voluntary request, you know, consider the things of God and repentance. This is you, you have got a covenant relationship with God and you have done things which are despicable. And um, now the Lord is bringing them before him and saying, what do you say, David? What are we going to do about this, David? How are we going to deal with this one, David? And so this is when that word contrition comes in David now needs to I guess we would say dig deep and find within himself uh, a genuine uh, attitude of we would say deep deep repentance we're going to explore the word in a second and so it's before him it's been exposed he's caught out so to speak and what are you going to do one of David's greatest attributes was he was a, a, a magnificent repenter he was terrific at repentance. Um, where are we? Now, therefore, the sword. So there were consequences. He, he wasn't just, you know, he was let off as far as he wasn't going to lose his life. But in the years to come, he was going to face the consequences of these actions. And the, the Lord um, puts them here. He says, now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house. You were going to have peace. Now you're going to have war. Because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of your own house. So you're going to face difficulties from your own children or from you know, people in your own home. I'll take thy wives before thine eyes and give them to thy neighbour. He shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou did, did it secretly, and I'll do this thing before all Israel and before the son. So, consequences deep scars. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 15. Nathan departed from his house. The Lord stroked the child that uh, Uriah's wife bare unto David and it was very sick. Um, sorry, in the bottom part of verse 14. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. I, did, I missed that out. Sorry. David therefore besought the Lord for the child. And this is contrition. And if you get an idea of uh, a, phys a visual idea of what David's doing, David therefore besought the Lord for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night upon the earth. Now, to cut it short, he did this for seven days. So it's almost like a visual abasement. I am nothing, I am crushed, I am destroyed, and I'm going to throw myself at the mercy of God. So he prayed and fasted, he lay prostrate before the, uh, the, the Lord, and he threw himself at the mercy of God. And uh, his servants were a bit upset because news came that the child had died verse 19 when David saw his servants whispered David perceived the child was dead therefore David said unto his servants is the child dead they said he is dead then David arose from the earth and washed anointed himself changed his apparel came into the house of the Lord and worshipped and came to his own house and when he required they set bread before him he did eat then his servants said unto him what is it that thou hast done Thou did fast and weep for the child, but it was alive. And when the child was dead, thou did rise and eat bread. 
And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he's dead, therefore, wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. And so he, the, the result of his act of contrition was that um, the child passed away, and in the end he found out he, there was nothing else that he could do. So he threw himself at the mercy of God. There was a sense of desperation in his actions. There was a total surrender to the will of God. There was a destruction of self, and there was a collapse of pride. Let's go to the New Testament, where there's another example of this. And I guess I want to get to First and Second Corinthians. Um, so First Corinthians. I'll try and make this as quick as I can, so we can move along. First Corinthians chapter five. Verse one, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you and such fornication as it is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father to wife. And you are puffed up. I don't want to explain that. I think most people understand what that is. Interestingly enough, the word fornication, the Greek is porneo, from which we get pornography. I'll leave that. Um, you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed among you might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that has done so this deed. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we are gathered together, and my spirit, not talking about the Holy Spirit, he's talking about his judgment, himself, his motivation, his thoughts, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 5, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, the spirit may be saved, again, the soul of that man in the day of the Lord Jesus. So this is uh, where we would base uh, putting somebody out of fellowship for, a mis for something that they've done wrong. So what has, that, what has happened is that uh, a wicked deed or a wicked act was committed, very much so in the eyes of God, but the people that were involved, whether it be the perpetrators or those that are around him, there was no real remorse, there was no uh, repentance or moral conscience to, behind this deed, but almost a sense of pride. And um, it says there that they were puffed up, haughty, inflated, proud. And so Paul writes a letter to them and says, this isn't good. This is bad. And you need to take some pretty drastic steps to address this situation. So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I guess this is where I want to concentrate a little bit of the time on. So why, why are we talking about these things? It's because... The Church of God is facing some very, very difficult times. And we are being bombarded uh, morally. We are bombarded physically uh, all the time, in a, in probably in a way that we have never faced until this time. Um, we are all facing it. It's not a particular group, not addressing any particular group. We're just all facing it. And sometimes we need to face some entrenched habits or some very difficult um, uh, things that we've just you know, allowed to occur in our lives and I don't know you sometimes I've, I've, I've got a bad habit that I've tried to overcome and just waking up one day and going oh, I'm not going to do that again it just doesn't work for me because you find yourself in a circumstance you find yourself uh, in a situation and that thing is triggered again and you find yourself going down that path again whether it might be that you're I don't know, let's pick on jealousy or you might be angry or you might be um, uh, judgmental, whatever. And there are deeper things as well. But you find yourself doing it again and you're doing it again and doing it again. Contrition is an act where you actually go much, much deeper and you take steps to try and eliminate completely. And we'll see if we can help you with that while just looking at these words. So in verse 8... This is Paul now writing his second letter. So he's had some feedback regarding 1 Corinthians. Now, 1 Corinthians just, doesn't just deal with the passage that we've just read about, about that um, wicked act, but, you know, the entire church was out of order and we're really thankful that they were because we got some clear instruction into our lives. 
And so he goes on here to say, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. And there's those words. Okay, so when I wrote the letter, I was very conscious of upsetting a lot of people. So when I confronted you with what was going on in your church, I didn't really want to do it because I knew that you'd get upset. But I'm not upset with the results of my letter. I'm not re upset that when I spoke to you, you actually then started this contrition. And we'll read that. Um, For though I made you sorry with the letter, I do not repent, though I did repent. For I perceive that the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. So yes, when we individually are confronted with some probably deep-seated issues in our lives, we react, and their reaction typically isn't good. You know, who are you to tell me and blah, 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 all that. But then in the cold light of day, when we are considering the words that have been said to us, usually in love by someone that cares, we think, you know what, they're trying to help me and I, should, I would do well to, to think about these things. And that's, and that's what's happening here with these people in this church. And it says, verse uh, 9. Now here we're going to see the actual definition of contrition. And it says here, For I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance, for you were made sorry after a godly manner. So this is the word of God working in you in a, in a really amazing way, in a really good way. And it says here, that you might receive damage by us in no things. For you knew, so you know, the, you know the source that I'm, I'm wanting to help you. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. So the end result is that I want to see you saved. I want to see you walking the Lord. I want to see you overcoming. That's the end result. Hard, hard yards along the way for this church. But let's clear these things up. We can make this work. Um, verse 11. Behold this selfsame thing, what, that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. In all things you have proved yourself to be clear in this matter. So the process of contrition is one where you receive information that you're not too happy about you're upset about it you're annoyed and then afterwards you realize they're trying to help and so what carefulness it wrought in you so the desire to correct the issue whatever it is there's an eagerness there's a diligence there's a haste you want to do it quickly you want to fix this quickly what clearing of yourselves there's an apology there there's a sense of I've done wrong, I'm sorry. What indignation, what displeasure, what exasperation, what fury, what rage against the, 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 the issue, whatever that issue is. What fear, I'm alarmed, I'm frightened, I'm terrorised. Why? Because this could cut me off from my salvation. What vehement desire, I love that word, it's a great longing. I want to see this behind me, I want to see this fixed, I want this to be overcome. What zeal, Zeal is heat, or passion, or eagerness, or determination. Spaniards are zealous, not always good. That, cr that creates a lot of problems. They get hot very quickly and then repent later. Lots of repentance. So there's a passion to do this. There's an eagerness to do this. There's a determination to get this right. What revenge. It's almost like you want to have vengeance against the thing. Meh, I gotcha. You know, you stab it. I'm just being very, whatever. Desperate desire to demonstrate a deep, deep repentance and to realise change. That's contrition. It's very different to, oh, I'm sorry. God lives in eternity with the contrite. So there are those who desperately want to demonstrate a real change of heart from, from their behaviour. God honours the contrite ones. Let's go to James chapter 4. I went to Zambia once and got off the plane. I'm in the car with a brother in the Lord. And he says, Brother Ramundo, whenever they did that, I knew there was some tricky question coming. He said, why are there wars in the world? I thought, oh, what am I going to say? 
And then this came to mind. Obviously, it was the Holy Spirit, not me. Verse 1. From whence come wars and fighting among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have. You cannot obtain. We're seeing a direct result of that right now in Russia, Ukraine. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture that is, <coughs> excuse me, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lust, lusteth to envy? So we have got an inherent character fault that we lust, we desire things that really we shouldn't have, we don't, they don't belong to us, we don't deserve them or they, they don't, they're not ours but we'll do anything we can to have them and so then there comes all of the difficulties and then it creates problems and we need to change those things. Verse 6, but he gives grace, wherefore he says God resists the proud and gives grace unto the humble. So if we're prepared to humble ourselves and go through this then we will be in good company in eternity with God. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> so you've seen that the process of contrition but there's still another aspect and uh, sometimes we need to do this as well. Uh, verse 8, uh, please read above and below, I'm just, I'm just pressed for time, otherwise we would spend some time on this. It says, Whether if, wherefore if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off, cast them from thee, for it is better for thee to enter into life, halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. So to put this into context, there was a sister that was at the leadership camp, a young lady, uh, six, I spoke to her later, her, later, her name was Izzy, she's 16 years old, and she spoke about some of the difficulties that she had experienced with mental health due to her addiction to social media, and it's a real thing that affects young, this, is not, this talk is not for those people, it's for all of us, all right? but I'm just using this as an example so you can understand cutting your hand and your foot off. So she got... Um, she was very deeply involved with this. She was, uh, it was affecting her. She went through a process, and part of that process was she came to a realisation that she had to cut her hand off. And what she did is that she deleted all of her social media accounts. She, she didn't just remove them from her f phone. She deleted them and has no contact whatsoever with that world. So for her, that was a trigger that would lead to difficulties, and so she removed the trigger. She removed the source. And so whatever your source or your trigger is, part of the contrition, that desperate desire to be in the salvation situation you are with God, is that you may have to look at, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to go near that again. I'm never going to be involved in that again. Whatever that is. Okay? That's just the thought there. Galatians chapter 6, and we are about to finish. So we've been concentrating just on us, the, the personal role. What do you do when you're confronted by... Ultimately, God confronts us with these things because he wants the best for us. So what happens? You know, we've been talking about our own, what do we need to do? And here we, we start to see the roles of what does the church do in these circumstances. And the church can be a pastor, oversight member, a good friend, a house leader a neighbour in the Lord, you know, someone that's close to you. It says, brethren, verse 1, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest they also be tempted. So we don't say, oh, you're a loser. You know, why, why can't you get over that? Because be careful, you might have a, a fault yourself that is going to cause you some trouble. So we approach in a spirit of meekness, Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Sometimes in a caring environment such as this one, 
members of the oversight will approach you and say, we want to help you. We want to help you with your life. We want to take your life from you just for a few moments, maybe a day, a week, a year, a month, and help you guide you through this very, very difficult stage. And then at the end of it, you can have your life back. All right? And they do it. Why? Because they really love you. They care for you. They want to support you. They don't want to see you shipwreck in this life. They'll assist you. They'll guide you. They'll counsel you. They'll reprove you. They'll give you. They'll say things that you don't want to hear, scriptural things you don't want to hear. And what is the role of the brethren that aren't directly involved in the ministry? We care. We support. We encourage. We listen. We're there for them. First Thessalonians. So God inhabits eternity with the humble and the contrite ones, those that are prepared to do whatever it takes to make sure that they live in that tent. Yeah? I want to live in that tent with God and I'm going to do everything I possibly can to make sure I get there. And if you have to come and help me, please do so. I will appreciate it. Not at first, but I will appreciate it. So the reason for it all, uh, verse 19, for you are our hope, our joy, sorry, for what is our hope? or joy, or crown, or rejoicing, are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming. You are our glory and our joy. Amen. Prayer time. Let's have some prayer.